G'day, AIM CA. We're here with Derek Edwards, uh, Professor of Psychology at the D Department of Social Sciences at the University of Loughborough, uh, talking about discursive psychology. So, Derek, what, what are the main ideas of discursive psychology? Well, uh, basically, discursive psychology aims to investigate, examine, uh, the ways in which ordinary people in everyday life use what we could loosely call psychological concepts in order to do whatever they're doing. So, for instance, if people are having a conversation, um, telling each other off, uh, um, engaged in any kind of work setting, they're at the same time talking to each other and using concepts to do with what kind of people they are, what mental states are like, uh, that they remember something, they feel something, they have concepts of emotion and so on. So psychological interests are part of everyday, ordinary, common sense. And the idea is, instead of dismissing that as wrong and preferring instead to do academic psychology, uh, what we try to do is do an academic study of the common sense nature of psychological concepts and reasoning in terms of how they're actually used and applied in everyday life. Uh, so it, for us, doing the discursive psychology, it's not a matter of common sense psychological concepts being accurate or good or whatever, they're real, they're used. They're, the, uh, they're part of the ways in which people are accountable to each other uh, and so they have their own empirical reality. We can record conversations, counselling sessions, doctor-patient interactions, everyday conversation and we can uh, look at the ways in which everyday psychological concepts figure and, and the ways in which when people are interacting with each other they are in some way oriented to managing, handling psychological kinds of issues. So, so what do you mean by sort of psychological concept? If you um, well, there's two parts of it. One is uh, the kinds of things that academic psychology is interested in and thinks it owns, like the way your mind works, uh, the nature of emotions and memory and so on. Uh, the other is that you can imagine, say, if you look at all the words in a language, in, say, a dictionary of English, it's full of all kinds of words that, in a common sense way, conceptualise mental life, personality, and all those sorts of topics that academic psychology takes a technical interest in. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a loose kind of field. Uh, I remember uh, first reading Harvey Sachs on conversation analysis. In one of his early lectures, Sachs is asked to define his topic. And he resists this. He says, yeah. you know, nobody should start with a definition. You know, this is a, it's a very academic thing to do. In fact, he's critical of psychology for starting in universities where, where you have to do what he called providing answers to exam questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and he characterized his preferred form of science, which became conversation analysis, as uh, beginning at least with a natural history phase, that is, finding out what there is in the world that might require an explanation. And you're open-ended. Like, you might end up with something you didn't start with if you're open to what you find and what you observe. So um, my preference in that respect is to not have a tight definition of the topic, but have a loose understanding of what it is you're interested in and pursue how that pans out when you do empirical work and conceptual work on it. So how does that work in with uh, sort of inductive or sort of uh, so-called emic methodologies that um, uh, are used in, in these kinds of fields? Um, the notion of inductive research and emic uh, perspectives is both real and normative. It's normative in the sense that uh, people will hold themselves accountable when they do work in discursive psychology or in ethnomethodology in CA to the notion that they are discovering uh, practices, that they're open to things, that they're doing, uh, uh, that they're looking to see what the data bears, as mm. Sachs said. Um, and that is a kind of both a description and a normative 
requirement for research. As a description, it's not all that good. Yeah. In that there's an awful lot of the research you do, which doesn't in fact start off with just casually uh, in a um, unfocused, uninterested way, trolling through loads of data, wondering what's of interest in it. That's not a very good description of what most people do most of the time. Uh, but that is what we're accountable to, such that if you have findings, you are obliged to see that they apply, to get a collection of similar looking instances, to be open to finding whatever's out there. That's part of research, but it, it, it's generally not how you start. I, mean, I will often start by uh, having something I'm interested in, uh, and it's usually, as it was in fact with Sachs, who's obviously my hero, um, it starts with a noticing. Like when I was, I was making some notes today, it was something I'd noticed during the Football World Cup, <laughs> which I watched. <laughs> um, and there was a comment where uh, someone said something like, uh, they were talking about um, a game in which uh, one of the underdog teams uh, for whom they had sympathy and it was doing pretty well. And someone said, yeah, but they could easily have gone behind in the first half, couldn't they? You know, something like that. Mm. And the other person then says, well, they could. So I'm thinking, ah, this is like a well-prefaced agreement. Um, usually well is taken to be some kind of dispreferred sign in conversation analysis. It's, it, mm. it's usually taken to signal some kind of problem. And I'm thinking, what kind of problem is that? And is there such a phenomenon as well-prefaced agreements rather than disagreements? This is a kind of technical thing, but yeah, yeah, usually yeah. when people say well before answering a question, it signals that they're going to not answer it in the terms asked. Uh, so th there's this item. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because of what I know about conversation. It's interesting from a discursive psychological point of view, because a lot of what conversation analysis comes up with turns out to be, in fact, handling and managing the kinds of loosely psychological issues that I started interested in, mm. because I began life as a psychologist rather than a sociologist or a linguist or whatever. Uh, so I'm looking at that kind of item as in some way managing the notion that uh, the person replying to the question uh, knows something about it independently, uh, and there's work on conversation analysis about that, and is also um, managing some notion that uh, um, he'd prefer to be saying something else. Mm. That uh, if there's something about the judgment of this team that should have been getting beaten that is reluctantly said because it's unfortunate, and there's some display of attitude, right. if I can loosely use the term attitude, yeah. some display of stance, let me say, in the way that answer is done. So I'm, I just heard it on t TV. Yep. Luckily, I had it being recorded. I went back, <laughs> I transcribed it, yeah. and I'm looking for other things, and I'm wondering what's going on with it, and if I can pursue it, and if I can also then address some of the work done on well-prefaced responses to questions and so on. Mm -hmm. And there has been some stuff. So that's kind of how I tend to work. I notice things, find things, go looking for them more systematically, and compare them to the literature, and. You know, it's not one-way traffic. It's not all induction. Mm. You know, as soon as you're doing inductive work, you end up doing something more like hypothesis testing. You start thinking, oh, I know what that is. It's one of those things. It works like this. I'll, kind of, I'll find some more. And now you're checking out your preliminary analysis on all the other examples you find. Mm. So you soon get into something that uh, traditional positivistic science uh, would recognize as um, something beyond induction. Mm. Uh, something involving ideas you've already got and testing them out with empirically. Yeah.